As part of our Sixth Form Science Ambassador team, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon. I don't think I've ever seen quite so many teachers in one room. We have experts in the field of neuroscience from Oxford University and the Wellcome Centre for Integrative Neuroimaging, revealing more about the process of learning. There will be a break at some point for tea, coffee, life and light food, followed by further talks and finally a Q&A session. Should you need any help this afternoon, please ask one of our badged ambassadors who will be circulating. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Caroline Jordan and I'm headmistress here at Headington. It's a great privilege to have so many of you with us today from our local state primaries up to uh, schools as far away as Hampshire. We're delighted that we've all come together today to really understand the science of learning. I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating session. So over to our compare now. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name's Chris. I'm a lecturer at Oxford. But for this afternoon, I shall be your gregarious host, uh, introducing the speakers uh, and just a few points of order. So we'll have four talks, then a short break, and then we'll have a panel discussion. You each have a bit of paper. If you have questions during the talks, write them down so you can remember them and bring them to the panel discussion. Any questions that don't get addressed, we will answer via Twitter. Follow at Oxford at Oxford NDCN, or at NDCN Oxford, <laughs> or at Oxford Win. <laughs> I'll, I'll check that and get back to you with the proper Twitter address. Um, excellent. So also welcome to those who are watching on Facebook. This has been live streamed. If you have any questions, do write them in the comments box. We'll get to those in the panel discussion. Uh, and again, we'll tweet out any questions we don't get to after the event. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll introduce the first speaker. Um, Heidi Johansenberg, head of the Welcome Integrative Neuro Neuroimaging <laughs> Centre, the WIND Centre. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, my name is Heidi Johansenberg. I'm a neuroscientist at the University of Oxford. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about exercising the young brain. I'm sure you've all uh, seen the headlines, activity is the best medicine, children who are physically active have greater brain power, regular exercise best for mental health, teach PE every day because it boosts the brain, exercise helps children learn, uh, academic performance at school is linked to exercise. So for the next 10 minutes or so I'm going to talk to you a bit uh, about the science behind these kinds of headlines. So to begin with, we'll just reflect on how physically active our children and young people should be and how physically active they are. As you probably know, the um, UK government has physical activity guidelines for all of us. So for different, different people in different age groups, the government recommends certain levels of physical activity that we should all engage in. And those levels are typically described in terms of the intensity of the activity, where moderate activity would include things like brisk walking or cycling, through to vigorous activity, including activities like playing tennis, intense sports or running, activities that really get the heart rate going. So in a room full of uh, teachers, I obviously wanted to give you a nice multiple choice question to start with. So thinking then about um, what do you think the government guidelines are for children and young people for how much physical activity they should be engaged in uh, every day. So your choices are A, 20 minutes of vigorous activity per day, uh, B, 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous uh, activity per day, or C, 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity per day. So who uh, thinks it's A, 20 minutes of vigorous? Anyone brave enough to yes? A couple of votes for A. Uh, B, 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous, quite a few debates. And C, 60 minutes. Okay, so fairly evenly split, but the correct answer was indeed C. So 60 minutes, the government recommends that all children and young people should be engaged in 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. That's activities that get the heart rate going every single day of the week. So in a moment, I'll show you the data that uh, describes how much activity our children and young people actually are achieving. So what percentage, I'll show you data for secondary age children, what percentage of children, boys and girls separately, are meeting those guidelines? So in anticipation of that, I wonder if you could hazard a guess as to what percentage of 13-year-old girls do you think meet those guidelines of 60 minutes per day? 
So who thinks A, 14%, you B, 42%, uh, C, 24%. So yeah, the answer is indeed 14%. So only 14% of 13-year-old girls meet those guidelines. And here's the data across uh, secondary age. So from 11, 13, 15, boys in uh, blue bars and girls in the red bars. So you can see the 13-year-old girls in the middle there. But from this graph, you can see that um, throughout secondary school, the majority of children are not meeting those guidelines. The activity levels fall off with increasing age, uh, and levels are lower in girls than boys. Uh, but even in the boys, by the time they get to age 15, fewer than 20% of boys and uh, less than 10% of girls are meeting those guidelines. So our children and young people are far less physically active than they should be. Obviously, that has important implications for their physical health, affecting things like heart and lung health and bone health. But uh, to what extent is this relevant to the children's educational outcomes? And I'm going to present some evidence which shows that physical activity is not only important for our physical health, but is it also important for our brain health and cognitive performance, meaning that it also has implications potentially <coughs> for academic attainment in school. So this slide will just summarize many decades of hundreds of experiments that have been done to test the effect of physical activity and exercise on the brain. And many of these experiments would have been conducted in uh, animal studies in a laboratory where we can very uh, uh, accurately manipulate physical activity and exercise levels and then measure their effect directly on brain cells and brain uh, blood vessels, for example, and other experiments might have been done uh, in human volunteers. But to summarise that evidence base, then, we know that physical activity increases blood flow to the brain. This increases the delivery of oxygen, the fuel for the brain. We know that over time, increasing activity uh, increases um, development and birth of new brain cells, so-called neurogenesis. We know that activity increases the growth of blood vessels and capillaries in the brain, so-called angiogenesis. We know that it boosts the formation of new connections between brain cells. So brain cells uh, communicate with one another, send signals via synapses or connections between the brain cells. And we know that when activity increases, the number of those connections increases. And finally, we know that physical exercise boosts the production of neurotrophins, proteins that help neurons survive. So there's many decades of evidence showing that when we increase the activity of an organism, that has beneficial effects on the brain, on the functioning and um, supply of energy to the brain. So all of that suggests then that we should take any opportunity to increase the amount of physical activity that children and young people are engaged in. And we have a real opportunity to do that in schools where we have a captive audience, where we have even um, physical uh, education incorporated within the curriculum. So in the context of a PE lesson, that's a real opportunity where we could um, have children and young people engaged in physical activity. So another multiple choice question, what percentage of a typical PE lesson do you think is, involves this uh, magical zone of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So think back to your PE lessons. For those of us who've uh, no longer engaged in them, some of you may be PE lessons. Think about your own lessons. What percentage of a typical PE lesson do you think is spent in moderate, engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity? So who would vote A, 50 to 60 percent? Couple of votes. B, 10 to 20 percent? Few votes. And C, 20 to 30 percent? Yeah, so top marks, you're right, the, um, on average, across a number of different studies that have quantified this um, in the UK and in other European countries using uh, Fitbit-style actigraphy or using heart rate monitors, only about 20 to 30 percent of a typical PE lesson is actually spent engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity. The government recommendations is that 50 percent of the lesson should be. There's obviously a lot of other things that have to be fitted into the PE lesson that plays constraints of, as to how much of the lesson can actually be engaged in, uh, in physical activity, but clearly there's an opportunity there to boost the amount of that lesson time that is spent in MVPA. And this has really uh, formed the basis for a large-scale um, research study that I want to tell you about, 
uh, that we've been engaged in for the last three years or so. And this is a um, study called Fit to Study. So an ex it's an experiment that's been funded by the Education Endowment Funda Foundation that you may have come across, as well as the Wellcome Trust. And it's a joint study between uh, a team at University of Oxford and a team at Oxford Brookes University. And within this study, we're testing whether increasing the amount of physical activity that children engage in during school PE lessons impacts on their academic attainment. So we've recruited around 100 state secondary schools across England. So around 10,000 pupils have been involved in the study, year eight pupils. And the intervention is that half of those schools, the year eight PE teachers have been asked to inject bursts of vigorous activity within the context of their typical PE lessons, whereas the other schools are carrying on uh, with business as usual. And at the end of that one year of intervention, when these pupils were at the end of year eight, their maths performance was tested on a standardized test. So this study, uh, the data collection just completed last summer, and we're in the process of analyzing those data, so we don't yet know, but the study will allow us to provide evidence on whether increasing activity improves academic outcomes here assessed through maths. We've also collected a lot of other data on these children, measuring things like their fitness, uh, their attitudes and beliefs and uh, lifestyle habits through questionnaires, as well as their cognitive um, skills through online tests. So I can show you a little bit of data from some of those measures taken at baseline at the beginning of the trial. So we found, for example, across the 5,000 pupils on whom we've gathered all of this, we have a complete data set. We found um, relationships between the different measures that you see here, such that the children who are more physically active and have more positive attitudes to school PE and are fitter are the very same children that tend to have uh, more positive self-esteem, so higher both global and physical self-esteem and have fewer social and emotional difficulties. So this reiterates a lot of evidence that's out there, which is physical activity and physical fitness is associated with more uh, positive mental health outcomes. Uh, we've also, within this study, um, investigated the brain in some of these children. So 100 children who've participated in the study have come into our brain scanning unit at the John Radcliffe Hospital and had a number of different brain scans taken, as well as done uh, physiological tests of their fitness. And from those data at baseline, uh, we've been able to show that the children who have uh, larger brain structures and more blood flow to the brain are the ones that are more physically active and have um, more healthy, active lifestyles. And over time, we'll be analysing the um, outcome data to see what effect that intervention has had on the children's uh, thinking skills and uh, academic attainment. So to sum up then, our take-home message is that, is that our children and young people are underactive. That has implications not just for their physical health, but also for their brains, uh, which in turn may have impl implications for their educational attainment. And schools and teachers are in a fantastic position to influence this through, for example, the PE lessons within the curriculum, but also through uh, transmitting messages about the importance of physical activity and through extracurricular opportunities. So thanks very much. Thank you for that, Heidi. Uh, really great to see interventions that are feasible and scalable, right? This could have massive impact and it's probably quite easy to, to roll out at uh, a public level, uh, but we can discuss that more in the panel discussion. So we're not going to take questions between talks, we're going to jump straight into the next talk. So please do write your questions down so we can address them during the discussion. Uh, but I'll hand over now to Kate Watkins. Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at Experimental Psychology. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to have this opportunity to talk to you about um, language in the brain. So I'm the head of the Speech and, Lang and Brain Research Group in the Department of Experimental Psychology. And today I'm going to talk to you about that remarkable feat of communication that is unique to humans. And I'm going to try and explain a little bit about what we know about the neuroscience of language and how we come about that information. But primarily, I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing in children who have language learning difficulties to try and understand more about how the young brain um, acquires a language or when it doesn't, um, what's wrong. That's the wrong slide. 
What happened there? <coughs> oh, it, there's one of these in between. Sorry. <laughs> you were supposed to be looking at this while I was telling you all of those things. OK, so um, much of what we know about language um, is learnt from studying adults who had brain damage, most often due to stroke, that causes them to have a language impairment known as aphasia. I'm going to show you this video of Sarah, Sarah Scott. It's from YouTube, and you can find later videos of Sarah if you'd like to. So Sarah suffered a stroke quite unusually at the age of 18 while in the classroom, and this caused her to lose language abilities that had previously been mature. So this video is from a year after the stroke. I'm pleased to tell you now that 10 years later, Sarah has made quite a good recovery and next week is going to talk at the Royal Society in London about her experience. So what's your name? Um, Scott. Oh, no. And what happened to you? A uh, stroke. You had a stroke last year? Yeah. Um, what happened? Can you remember what happened? Um, um, uh, school and English class. Okay. And I um, book and I read it aloud. Um, but I can't because strength. And so I turn the and I'm also um it's um the same as um the same kind of thing as um you you know pins and needles. Yeah, the mm -hmm. same and also farm as well. Okay, so much of what we know, as I said, has been learnt from studying adults who have brain damage um, like Sarah's. And we've been doing this for about 150 years, and we have learnt that damage to the left side of the brain causes that loss of language ability that you saw in Sarah's video. If the damage is over this part of the brain at the front, it encompasses, encompasses an area known as Broca's area. It causes problems like Sarah was having, with retrieval and um, knowing the names of things, bringing the words to mind. It's the end of school, not an alarm. <laughs> um, and it's what we call kind of telegraphic speech, like the speech of young children, where you might say window, door. Um, they just want to communicate with you, but they're not necessarily using those function words that we use to create grammatically well-formed sent sentences. So this area is known as Broca's area after the French neurologist who first made the relationship between damage here and the kinds of expressive language difficulties that Sarah showed. Typically, these patients are quite good, and you saw that in Sarah's video, at understanding language, so they know what's being said to them. Their problem is with output. In contrast, if you have damage over this part of the brain at the back, um, you have a different kind of language disorder. So in this case, um, the main problem is with understanding, so it's comprehension that is impaired, but one of the most striking problems that people describe in this group of patients is that their speech, although fluent and well-formed, grammatical, is empty of meaning. So it's strikingly lacking meaning. It's sort of a little bit of gobbledygook. It, it just, but the, part, the patient with this kind of brain damage doesn't seem to be aware of that. So this area is called Wernicke's area after the German neurologist who first made the link between patients with damage here and that language comprehension deficit. I have another video of Byron who has this kind of aphasia. Hi Byron, how are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? 
We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked to the people for them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. We the Bella stayed in the moment. He had a water person for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to Waiting to short you. right here and then we'll save the range right there for okay. them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show down. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. Okay, so you got the idea. He, he didn't understand that question about the iPad and he just continued with what was quite good kind of communicative intent. He was engaged in that social process, but there was, there was no content to his communication. So that's the textbook picture of the brain areas involved in language. And as I said, that picture has been gathered by studies of adults who've suddenly lost their previously sophisticated and automatic use of language. And what I'm interested is in, in is what happens in the, child, in the child's brain when you have that kind of damage. And does that kind of damage explain the language learning difficulties that a large number of children have during development? So what do we know about children's brains and their language development? Well, the first striking difference with um, adult patients is that children who acquire brain damage early in development do not exhibit these kinds of aphasia. And that's a good thing, right? We would expect that the brain isn't yet specialised for language, and so if the damage has occurred before a piece of brain or some cortex has become dedicated in its function to that process, we can damage it and that organisation can occur somewhere else. And we all know that the brains of younger children tend to be more plastic, and so there are, there are more options for this reorganisation and recovery of function. The second most striking uh, difference compared to adults is that when we look at those children who do have language learning difficulties, so I'm going to refer to that as developmental language disorder, these children have quite limited abilities to learn their native language, but they don't have brain damage. In fact, when we scan these children, there's very little that we can see with the naked eye that would explain the language problems they're having. So instead, we need quite sophisticated techniques of imaging and quantitative methods that would allow us to document the differences that we suspect cause these problems. And those differences are going to be in terms of the number of neurons in an area that we might be able to measure in terms of, neuron, of the size of brain regions, how they communicate with each other, and how well connected um, they are. So what is this developmental language disorder that I mentioned um, in the previous slide? Well, you may have heard of it. Um, it's a new name for a disorder that's been described for over a century in children, sometimes known as developmental dysphasia, more recently as SLI, or specific language impairment. Um, we think that DLD affects um, children um, language learning, but you can't explain that impairment in terms of a lack of, in, of opportunity, social factors, or hearing loss. So we estimate that DLD, a largely unknown disability or a hidden disability, affects 7% of children, so that would be about two in every primary classroom. And if you'd like to know more about DLD, there's a campaign called Raising Awareness for DLD, or Raddled. You can Google it and find out more information about what's being done to help these children and, um, and the kinds of problems that they have. On the next few slides, I have some examples of the language produced by a child with DLD. And it would be interesting, as Heidi did in, in the previous talk, to ask you to guess how old you think this child is based upon this narrative. So this is a recall of a story that they told to us um, 10 or 15 minutes earlier when they were shown these pictures and asked to tell us a story about them. So the boy was feeding the fish um, with the fish food. Then the mom gave him some money to buy a new fish. Um, he went down the park 
the street and the, went to the pet shop. He said, can I get another fish? And he grabbed a fish and put it in the red bag. He saw two girls and they wanted to get ice cream with him. They did, and then they had a good day. But the little girl put the fish in a different bag and the doll in his bag. Then they set it off. Then the fish gave the mom the bag. She looked at it and it was just a baby doll. She ran to the phone, tried to call, but she saw two little girls with a yellow bag and took out the fish and put it in the fish where the mummy lived. Okay, so there were 149 words there, 19 utterances, almost eight words per utterance. In your estimation, how old would you expect that child to be? Votes for five years? Nine years? Thirteen? Okay, so not many of you. I was worried where you were all going, because actually that was um, a 13-year-old. Sorry, um, that was supposed to be on the screen. So yeah, that was the language of a 13-year-old. Um, I was worried when you didn't put your hands up that you thought it would be 13. Was it just because you were unsure? Well, we, we can talk about it later. Um, it wouldn't be fair to say that that particular narrative is typical of DLD. In fact, DLD covers a range of different kinds of problems. Children are likely to have more than one problem. So some children may struggle with expressive language, like this one, or receptive language abilities. So they may have difficulty understanding quite complex grammar that has implications for instructions in the classroom. And some children may struggle with producing sequences of sounds. So I'm going to show you an example um, from a family that we studied um, where, some of the, where, where we knew that there was a genetic cause of the language impairment that half of these family members had. So it's rare to know what the genetic cause is, um, although it's suspected in many cases um, with DLD. And here we have a three-generational family who have a mutation in a gene called FOXP2 that causes their language impairment. The impairment they have is best characterized as a verbal dyspraxia and evident when you ask them to repeat words. So I have a recording here. I want you to repeat these words after I say them and repeat each word five times, okay? Say artillery. Artillery, 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 artillery. Okay. Say impossibility. Impossibility, 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 impossibility. So when we looked at the brains of um, these affected family members who had that um, speech sequencing problem, there was nothing visible on the MRI that we could say explained what was causing um, that language impairment. So using um, more high resolution analysis, we were able to detect a difference as suspected in the size of some brain areas that were smaller in the affected members of the family compared to their unaffected <coughs> siblings. So these brain areas are um, what are called the basal ganglia nuclei. They're a set of nuclei deep in the middle of the brain, and they're typically affected in movement disorders that you might have heard about, like Parkinson's disease. They're also important for learning, and we know from other studies that they're required particularly for vocal learning. So in humans, we think they're important um, for learning articulatory sequences, such as those used for speech, but also sequences used um, for grammar in sentences. We confirmed in a second study of children with DLD who were unrelated but had similar difficulties to those in that genetic um, pedigree I showed you, that the same brain areas were also smaller um, in those children compared to their unaffected siblings or to controls. So quite strikingly, those brain areas, Broca's and Wernicke's area that I described to you at the beginning that we've learned about from the study of adults, 
are not implicated in the causes of the problems that children with DLD have. Instead, we're seeing a deficit in this learning system that's deep um, in the brain. So what we're doing next is we're following up uh, that study, and I've got a little bit of a pitch here and more information at the back for later, to try and find out more about children with DLD. As I said, there's quite a diverse picture of impairment in these kids, so we want to scan a lot of them, and we're looking for volunteers. The study is called BOLD, which stands for Brain Organisation in Language Development, and it's funded by the MRC. We're hoping to get 80 children between 10 and 15 who have developmental language disorder and have grown up speaking English in the UK, and another 80 children matched for age and sex who don't have those language problems. We're, about, we're at about 70 children so far, so nearly halfway through, um, but we'd be very interested if you know of any other children who might be interested and you can find out more at this website. So thank you very much for listening. Take that away. Thank you very much. Oh, for I've that done bit. something. <laughs> Easy. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Excellent. So uh, yeah, everyone send your kids to Kate. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Next up. Uh, we have Mark uh, from Experiment Psychology. He's going to be talking to us about reward and the brain, uh, and maybe talking a little bit about some myths too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a great pleasure to be here. So, does anyone know who this is? Anyone seen this person recently? No one? Okay, so this person, there's no reason why you should have done. This person is probably the preeminent free rock climber in the world. So this is a picture of him halfway up El Capitan in the USA. And we can see a quote from him underneath. So you just accept the fact that if anything goes wrong, you're going to die. Free soloing is as close to perfection as rock climbing gets. And it does feel good. So that's an extreme example of um, the way in which you might make reward-guided decisions in life, but actually, to some extent, it encapsulates what we're all kind of doing at a simple level. So most organisms, including us, what we're trying to do as we go through life is to maximize the rewards we get whilst also minimizing the punishments. And so what I'm going to talk about is a bit on the, the sort of half of that, about what we've understood about how you can learn about the rewards in your environment and how our brain might help us do this. So rewards are, at one level, very simple. So um, here we've got a nice picture of ice cream, um, which probably is a reward for most of us. It's something that will fulfill a, a need if you're hungry. There's also sort of more abstract rewards. So um, things sort of that give you information about your performance can be external things, but it can also be intrinsic. And there's other things that are harder to categorize and harder to study in the lab, sort of social behaviors and other types of processes. And the thing that makes them complicated is while we really sort of can all intuit what a reward is, that they're very subjective things and they're also very malleable. They change in lots of different situations. So just take this ice cream here, which is probably a reward to most people in the room, but the ice cream won't be the same reward um, depending on whether you've started with some haute cuisine salad or you've just eaten through a tub of Ben and Jerry's. It also depends on your current motivation. Um, if you're like uh, someone who I think some of you in this room might recognize, like my daughter, when she sees this, there's only one thing that's appealing about that, and that's the taste of that ice cream. But to some others here, including myself, you might be thinking also of its sugar content and its, and its health consequences. And rewards also are very much um, influenced by the social situation. So you might think that this is a surprisingly miserable looking child with an iced lolly here. And it is a bit surprising until you see who he's standing next to. <laughs> so a reward is only rewarding depending on the context in which you receive it. And I guess one of the key things that 
um, psychologists and neuroscientists have been doing for well over a century is to try and understand rewards, understand how we learn about these rewards, and understand how we can use that information to predict our environment and, and, and guide our behavior. So probably a lot of you in the room will have know something about Pavlov's dog. So that same process of, of tying together um, a, an abstract cue in the world with something good. We can see here, you can imagine for anyone who's been in Oxford for a while for that ice cream, you might imagine that this abstract purple cow associated with G&D's ice cream has come to associate, be associated with that reward. And the same is true with even more sort of abstract things. So I think you will all recognize this subset of um, cues and that they'll all be associated with different um, reinforcers and will all potentially motivate you to go and behave in a certain way. So what do we know about what our brains do and how our brains do this kind of thing? So one of the chemicals which is really important for guiding reward-guided learning is dopamine. And you probably all know something about dopamine. So it's one of the hot things you'll find in the popular press. So this is from a few years ago where um, the Guardian decided that you should dress yourself happy by wearing yellow off the back of that film La La Land. I think it was last year, Tom Kerridge came out with this book about the dopamine diet as his stay happy way to lose weight. And if you take nothing away from this talk apart from this one piece of information, it's that that is just wrong. So dopamine does not, it's not associated with pleasure. And, and it's only got a very loose relationship with happiness. And the reason we know this is that even though it's quite hard to look at fine detail about dopamine in the human, we've actually, what's, what's intriguing is we share a very similar dopamine system with lots of other different animals. And so not just our closest mammalian relatives, but also with songbirds, so that type of vocal learning that Kate was talking about before seems to be a dopamine-dependent process. Even the tiny fruit fly has dopamine neurons which seem to perform a very different, similar function to, they, to what they do in our brains. And so what we're able to do is to do very fine-scale studies in these, in these controlled environments and apply them to our understanding of human reward learning. So what does dopamine signal? So one of the things is it just seems to be interested when there's something surprising, something salient that appears. So here's a random picture, the picture of a clown Grimaldi. Um, it doesn't really have any value, any valence. You won't be particularly, um, there's no reason to uh, associate it with anything in particular. But probably all of your brains will have had a pulse of dopamine when you saw that. So dopamine does signal rewards, but only when it's unexpected. So if I suddenly offer my daughter some ice cream in mid-morning, then if I were to be able to look in her brain that, and look at the dopamine, you'd see she got a pulse of dopamine at the point in which you give her the ice cream. But the key thing is that actually what dopamine comes to be associated with is the expectation of those good things. So certainly in my household, um, that delivery lorries have got a particular value in the house. And so the rather kind of neutral sounds and of um, a d delivery lorry coming up to our house and the doors opening to that, that now that's associated with the good things that may come inside that. And again, if we were to measure inside my daughter's head, you'd see that pulse of dopamine now. So they're just kind of random sounds associated with the good thing that's coming. And actually, when they get the ice cream, there's very little response there. So it's to do with the prediction and the surprise, not to do with the reward itself. And on those dreaded days where, um, where there's actually um, an unavailable product and there isn't there, then you get a different response of disappointment. And again, if we could measure the dopamine in her head, you'd see that you'd get this dip in the signal. So essentially what dopamine is signaling is it's signaling something about reinforcement when, when the world is surprisingly better or worse than you expect. And it's also providing you with predictions about the world which can motivate you to do stuff. And sort of fr building from that very sort of simple framework, we can actually now investigate really complex things about the way in which that we learn about rewards in the world and we make decisions. <coughs> 
So a lot of the stuff that my laboratory does is particularly about sort of trying to understand this in the normal brain and how, this, um, how these processes work. But people use that scaffold and then to, um, to think about, for instance, how that decisions and learning change across the lifespan and also what might be going awry in certain psychiatric disorders. So I'm just going to give you a couple of very quick examples um, from thinking about development. And so this isn't work that I've do directly, but it's, but it's work in, in, the, in the sort of same framework. So it won't be a surprise to anyone in this room that statistically adolescents are more likely to engage in risky behavior than adults. And so the question is, is there anything that we can find out about that by looking in the brain and to looking at the ways they, they learn and make decisions? So one of the things that's been known for a while is that if you just look in uh, the brain at how um, different brains of different ages respond to unexpected rewards, you see an interesting pattern such that the adolescents seem to have a much bigger brain response. So that's 13 to 17 year olds in the middle than either slightly younger children or young adults. And then the question is, well, so what does that mean in terms of how they learn about the world, in terms of how they make decisions? And actually, it's, we don't really know yet. There was a lot of debate in the field about, what it, about the influence that it actually has. But there's a couple of things that are emerging that seem very intriguing. So one of the things is that um, their brain responses, as well as their behavior, seem to be really strongly influenced by having a social peer, sometimes just in the room, not necessarily interacting with them. Intriguingly, you also see a very similar effect even in a rat brain. So it seems to be not so much the sort of cognitive social factors as something even sort of more low level than physiological. And we can also look at how um, adolescents learn and compare it to, to, to the way that which young adults learn. And again, interestingly, there's a lot of similarities between those two groups. But one of the things that's emerging is whereas adolescents seem to be particularly good at learning from their own experience, where they sometimes fall down is where they have to have these sort of what if scenarios. So if they get information about what, they, what could have happened if they'd taken another course of action, whereas young adults are able to, to incorporate that into their future decisions, adolescents seem to be much more fixed on based on their own experience. And equally, they're much less sort of able to take on advice from older adults. So that just gives a flavor of the way in which we're starting to use some of those frameworks, both at the behavioral level and at the brain level. And I guess whilst it ne won't necessarily tell us why you might want to climb up a cliff face, it will hopefully give us some insights into the way in which the brains work. So thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, from exercise to ice cream. <laughs> Um, no, that's fantastic, uh, and it's really interesting to get insights into the adolescent brain and how that affects behaviour, because uh, quite often I find working with adolescents, uh, when you do any work with the media, they're so uninterested um, in the adolescent experience, and it's often written off as, uh, well, they're just badly behaved. <laughs> uh, so that's useful. Uh, okay, our final talk of the afternoon. Uh, Louise Auckland is going to talk to us about mindfulness, um, and she's coming from the Department of Psychiatry. Hello. I've got the last slot. I've got the loudest voice and I'm probably going to ignore, annoy all the cameras and move forward. Am I allowed to do that? Is that okay? Okay, that's good. Sorry, I'd prefer to be closer to my audience. Um, hello, I'm Louise and I work for the Department of Psychiatry, but I have been 15 years a science teacher in secondary schools in Oxfordshire. And about two years ago, I left, uh, I'll tell you why in a moment, um, but I now work as a freelance trainer for schools in mindfulness, primary through to secondary, but also work on public engagement of young people in the schools that we work with on our mindfulness trial that I'll talk about later. So why did I leave teaching? Well, I've been interested in the brain ever since, oh, about five years into teaching, I did a Royal Society partnership grant with Holly at the back of the room over there and working with teenagers and in fact, Emily on the back row one of my old colleagues. And I started thinking, oh, this brain's quite interesting. I'm a biology teacher. Why don't we teach about the brain? And a few more projects later, I did a few more with Holly. Uh, I started thinking even more so, why do we not teach young people about the brain when this is the organ that is responsible for all of their learning and their emotional regulation? 
and their behavior. Alongside that, I was PSHE coordinator and started seeing increasingly young people coming and knocking on my door as a tutor, stressed about very small things that in my, in my head were fairly trivial and couldn't work out why they were such big things for those young people, but they were big things for them. So I started training myself in mindfulness, having come across a TED talk about it and thought, oh, that looks interesting. I'll go and train myself in mindfulness, then train to teach mindfulness to young people. And the combination of those two factors and potentially a little bit about where education is right now, I decided to take a bit break from education and find out more about it. So thinking about that, in particular in my reading, I came across this. The average age of onset of mental health disorders in young people is 14. It's 14, which struck me that why aren't we doing much about it in schools at that time, given the fact that actually 14-year-olds spend most of their life in school or asleep. That's where most of their time is spent. So we spend a lot of time talking about curriculum training. We spend a lot of time monitoring young people about their learning, but we spend less time thinking about their social and emotional well-being. So again, it thought, I thought, right, let's find out a little bit more about that. I'm going to talk to you about mindfulness. I'm going to talk to you about neuroscience and what I work with young people on when I do that. Now, mindfulness, if I say to young people, I said last week to some young people I was trying to teach mindfulness, they said, well, it's fake. It's that dooby-doo stuff where you sit down and go, mmm, sit like a frog. Okay, so we'll just get a definition out there first. There's Kabat-Zinn. So Kabat-Zinn is the person that took mindfulness uh, and made it secular within the health service in the US for treating chronic pain for patients. And he says, well, mindfulness is an awareness that arises through paying attention. How many times have we said to young people, could you pay attention? Put your focus this way. Make sure you're paying attention. Attention this way. When do we teach young people to pay attention? Maybe in primary, not having been a primary teacher, but worked quite a bit with primary training, maybe you do some attention training there, but not a great deal. Yet we then expect them at GCSE age to be able to sit in an exam and pay attention for a very long time. But how many teachers would make them come in and be silent for most of their lesson and pay attention on the same task for the whole of their lesson? Very rarely, because you wouldn't be seen as a good teacher if you did that, but we expect them to do it in an exam. In the present moment, now young people are very good at thinking, well, what was I doing yesterday? What was I doing last week? Adults will do it as well. We ruminate, we tell stories, we go round and round in our heads. Or we think about what we're doing next week or how many teachers have said, well, you've only got eight weeks till your exams. It sat's in five weeks. Focus your attention. Well, how about let's worry about right now? And that's what we do through mindfulness. And finally, and probably my favorite bit is this non-judgmental. So with kindness and with compassion, uh, and definitely the stage I was at, I needed a little bit of a break from teaching to find a bit more kindness and compassion because I didn't really feel it was in my heart at the time. I've, uh, luckily, it's come back a little bit now. Okay, so those are three parts of the definition of mindfulness. And how do we do mindfulness? Well, we practice it. It's a skill. We practice through meditation. And because we're present in the moment, we do it through sensations that are in our body. And something that constantly is there, uh, well, hopefully it's constantly there, is our breath. So we often focus on our breath. Okay, and I'll explain later why I think that's helpful. What are the contexts for mindfulness? We see it a lot in the news. I'll just tell you some of the places where it is used. Uh, this young man here, hopefully you'll recognize him. Uh, Djokovic currently pays for primary schools throughout Serbia to be trained in mindfulness. He uses it in his own tennis, as does the UK tennis team. Uh, I went to a lecture by their sports training coach on mental toughness. And he said, we can train ability up to 90% of fitness, up to 99% similar in all athletes. But the mental toughness is what is making a difference. Don't worry about the shot you've just lost. Don't worry about the shot you're about to do. If you're focusing on whether you're going to win this tournament, you've lost. You need to focus on this next shot. Nicola Benedetti on stage as she plays violin in the present moment. She says she needs to be in the flow, not worrying about whether she's going to miss a note or not. Houses of Commons. Okay, we've, many MPs are currently being trained in mindfulness so that they can uh, bring compassion and kindness to politics. <laughs> Something's gone a little bit wrong there, hasn't it? Uh, businesses. It's, it's a fad of business at the moment. Fad, I'll come back to that word a bit later. Uh, a lot of people being taught, executives being taught mindfulness. 
It's currently one of the recommendations, nice recommendations for treating anxiety and depression. It is, uh, has an equivalent effect as medication in re reducing relapse for anxiety and depression. And of course in schools, so this is the Mindfulness in Schools project which have curriculum for primary and secondary school, which is what I got trained in when I was still teaching. Uh, this programme here, Mind Up, particularly with a focus on primary schools and lower secondary schools, again it's something that I train in. And you've got the recent research findings of the Healthy Minds in Schools, which uses a shortened version of the Mindfulness in Schools project curriculum. I can answer any questions on those later if needs be. I'm going to skip now to the neuroscience. Sorry, I will try and stand still a bit more. To the neuroscience. So when I go into school, what do I think, as an ex-teacher, is important for us to tell our young people when it comes to their emotional well-being? Because that's really where my focus is. And there are three areas of the brain that I always like to teach young people about and I think should really be on the national curriculum for a very young age. The first is the prefrontal cortex, this bit here. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for the executive functions of the body, planning, organising, thinking, uh, processing, analysing, evaluating, all the words that we expect young people to use in every lesson. It's also responsible for moral and ethical decisions, so we expect them to use it in the playground, out in relationships with teachers. How often do we teach them? That's where in the brain we're hoping that their attention is right now. The other area is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus responsible for short-term memory, and those two need to work quite well because we often say, what do you already know about this subject? Well, let's go and have a look in my hippocampus and come back again and use it and analyse it and restore it again. Obviously, the neuroscientists in the room would hate the fact that I've just said it like that, but there we go, my teacher head on. And then you've got the amygdala, okay? Who's heard of the amygdala before? So quite a few of you. So the amygdala, hopefully you'll be familiar with, this is your fight, flight or fright response. This is, come and stand up at the front of the class and read out your poem. This is the parental complaint about your teaching. So it's not just children that get into the fight, flight or fright freeze, you know, those sort of modes. It's behavioural difficulties, it's anger, it's emotional outbursts and so on. It's all the things that we see in the classroom but what happens with the neuroscience? Well, if our amygdala is firing and we're in that stressful situation or angry or frustrated or emotional, shut down the PFC. This is survival mode now. Let's get rid of that. And let's get rid of our hippocampus. Now, what did we just say we needed for learning? So really, the value of understanding that relationship in those three parts, I think, is crucial for learning. So how does mindfulness help? Help, And that's the next connection I'd like to think about. Well, I said before, mindfulness is about practicing a meditation regularly. It's a skill that you have. We get better attuned to what's happening in our bodies when we practice mindfulness. We get to sense, we get to realise when our body is entering that fight, flight or freeze mode. And if we're able to do that, we can take our attention away from our head to our breathing or into our feet or somewhere else in the body so that our amygdala gets a chance to calm down. If our amygdala calms down, then we can start thinking straight again. The other aspect of neuroscience that I always like to teach, if I went in as a neuroplasticity, it's been mentioned already tonight, the today in, in the talks before, but neuroplasticity, this ability to change our brain. When I went to school, the brain you had in your head was the brain that you had when you left school, the brain you had when you were later in life, okay? It's, it's not really taught enough, but how valuable for a young person to realise that if they can't do something in year seven, it doesn't matter because they can practice, practice, practice and actually physically change the structure of their brain in doing so. They can make new neural pathways, they can change their behaviour. How valuable for someone that struggles with ADHD who's seven years old to recognise that actually they can practice and they'll be able to change their behaviour through practice. So what is the evidence? Because as I said last week in a school, oh, it's rubbish. My mum says it's fake. Okay, so you've got quite a, you know, you've got a barrier to get through there. Where's the evidence? I'm a scientist after all. There are quite a few papers that have looked at large scale meta-analyses of mindfulness. And there's a lot of enthusiasm, but the university here, the Mindfulness Centre here in Oxford felt that attached to department of psychiatry, felt that really we needed something a bit more robust in order to do that. So I have joined this, this team, the Myriad trial, which is out of, the, out of Oxford, Cambridge and UCL, and we're investigating a number of things. We're investigating 
the underlying cognitive mechanisms and the neuroscience that might be taking place. That's particularly focused in Cambridge and UCL. We are looking at teacher training and implementation in schools. Schools currently don't have a lot of money. Training a lot of teachers in mindfulness is very expensive. How can that be done? Can it be done effectively cheaper? Or does, do we need to spend the money and commit? And finally, the part that I'm involved in is a trial in 75 schools across the UK looking at mindfulness versus teaching as usual. Okay, and for that survey, those are our three outcome measures that we'll be doing, and we're about uh, one and a half years through that at the moment. Um, but it's a seven-year programme, so it's a long one, but it's the largest trial of its kind into mindfulness. What would I say to you, or what would I say to myself if I was still teaching? I would say, find out about the relevant neuroscience that's relevant to your work. You are working with young people's brains, find out about it, and you've all made a very sensible decision by coming here tonight. Well done, first step done. Second step, teach young people about their brains. It's not on the national curriculum in any detail, but how valuable for even someone this big to recognise that actually their behaviour, their learning, their conversations, their language, their exercise, all these things actually impact on the most important organ in their body. It's just a shame that no one writing national curriculum has realised that we should have it there. Next, find out about mindfulness, particularly if you're a cynic, because that's even better, because then you can start seeing what it's all about. If not, think about attention. I like attention with compassion. That's, you know, sort of why I came into mindfulness. Have a look at whether there's anything you can do there. And finally, even... To teach someone mindfulness is a long, long process of getting the qualifications to do it. But there's a lot that you can do in the short term and with short skills. But even if not, start having conversations with the young people you work with about those three areas of the brain and how they impact on young people's learning and their emotional and behavioural control. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that mindfulness is a bit of a divisive issue. So I'm sure we'll have a lot of interesting discussion uh, after the break. So we will break now for some food and some coffee. And then we'll have the panel discussion. We'll have three other uh, researchers joining us. Uh, so please do use the opportunity to get all you've ever wanted to know about neuroscience answered. Um, and we'll reconvene in about 20 minutes. <laughs>